The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Good morning. Actually, my job is almost done after the first two presentations. <laughs> so I can sit down now. First, I want to acknowledge MJ Amelli, who is my PhD student. He's done a lot on the analytical simulation. So in this paper, I will present both the experiments and the analysis. What I'm going to present today is mostly column to footing connections. But since Sarah asked the question, how fast are we supposed to accelerate construction? I thought I'll show you some pictures. John also mentioned the self-propelled modular transporters, and in Utah they've been doing a lot of these things. So here you see a whole bridge being moved, and it's a simple span, so in a simple span you don't need to worry about bends or anything else. So this is overnight. There is also slidings, and now we're counting in terms of hours, 16 hours. And one that's really impressive is a two-span. Each span is 177 feet, and this is resting on columns in the interior span and on abutments at the two ends, and this is also happening overnight. So this is what accelerated means to some people in Utah. So going to the bridge bends, though, the work that John had done is shown here with the sockets and the ducts. There was some work done on light rail in Utah where they used the splice leaf connectors, which I'm going to talk about. And of course, splice leaf connectors have also been studied by Haper in Reno and also by Tazarv in a slightly modified form, which uses a pedestal right above the footing. We decided to look at mechanical couplers, and Haper has talked about them. There are various forms. The one we're using is the one I will show in just a second. Raul also used these. These are coming from the building industry for buildings. So the one we use is this grouted splice sleeve connector. This is for a number eight bar typically has a field dowel and a factory dowel, and everything is connected with high strength grout. High strength here means something like 14,000 PSI. So, of course, we did some tests uh, before we put it into an element, and the tests were just pure tension tests. And in all the tests, what failed was the bar itself. So the bar fracture of the yielding at about 1.68 of the yield strength of the bar. We never had any bar pullout, okay? So the grout is very strong and it holds the bars together. Of course, one of the things that we noticed in all of these tests, there was a little grout cone forming at the end of these sleeves. These sleeves have corrugations inside, and as you can see, they're not just pipes. They have a conical shape to it with some thickness at the outside of the pipe at the top. So we noticed that this grout cone was forming, but we didn't know when was it forming. And that becomes interesting when you're trying to model this in an element, like a, a column or a footing. So we decided to use some acoustic emission testing to figure out exactly when does this cone form and at what point in the yield performance of the bar. This is a pretty sophisticated system. It's a non-destructive testing system, and here we use two of the acoustic sensors. A uh, former student of mine loaned us this system. It's called Digital Wave, and he works for the composite company, Orbital ATK in Utah. So what we were able to find with these two sensors is that actually, when we superimpose the event history, and the event is an acoustic wave that has an amplitude a little higher than the threshold, 
Uh, and you can plot it and you can see when you match it with the stress behavior against pseudo time, you can see that there is yielding, hardening, and fracture of the bar, which coincides with the last point in the acoustic emissions test. But then if you look at the acoustic emission event rate, you clearly see that there is a point beyond which the grout cone has formed. There is no more events happening. And that point, if you plot it against the yield performance, it's about 1.2 times the yield strength of the bar. At that point, the grout code has formed. I'm going to show today two different details of column to footy connections. And as mentioned earlier, these connections are supposed to accelerate construction, so we need to be able to load, at least with gravity load, the joints very quickly. In Utah, they want to do it the next day. And the good news is the grout actually attains about a 7 KSI to 10 KSI in one day. So actually, you could. You could move on and put your columns in, grout it, go the next day, put your cap in, grout it. They just want to get out of there in one weekend. So the two alternatives we used. Now, one caveat, though, is currently Ashto does not allow you to put any connectors like this in the plastic install. So it's not allowed, and as you can see, we try to get around that by using in the first alternative the sleeves in the footing, and in the second alternative though, we did use them in the column, in the plastic hinge region. These columns were octagonal for ease of construction, and you can see the cross section here is 21 inches octagonal. There are six number eight bars in the column, which is longitudinal reinforcement ratio 1.3%, and there is number four Spirals are two and a half inches, which is about 1.9% transverse steel ratio. Bars, as John had mentioned, are difficult to bend inwards, but we actually tried to do that. And I'm going to show you some pictures, but there are also some that are bent outward at the bottom of the footing. The column is 21 inches octagonal, but the bars are spread in a circular orientation. That's how UDOT likes to build their columns. So this is about a half-scale model of a bridge. The columns are eight and a half feet in height, and the footings are six foot long, three foot wide, and two foot thick, okay? Everything here was designed for the casting plates using Ashto seismic and also the Caltrans provisions. So this casting place specimen is used as a control, and that satisfies all the requirements. Maybe over-satisfies the requirements, especially when it comes to the footings. But anyway, it satisfies the requirements. Also, the bars in the casting place were not spliced. They were taken all the way up to the top. The first alternative then, we have the sleeves in the footing, as you see here. And then in this situation, I will show it, we do a pre-grout operation. We close both of the vents of the sleeve. There are two vents, as you can see here. And then we lower the bars. There are seven inches sticking out of the column. And Sarah talked about templates. If you don't use templates, you're out of luck here. So you have to use wooden templates to match the location of the bars with respect to the sleeve. In the second alternative, the sleeves are in the column. And in this case, we are using post-grout. The grout is pumped through the bottom hole and comes out from the top hole so all the air voids can come out. In addition, in this second alternative, we have actually debonded about eight bar diameters, the bars that come from the column into the footing. Okay, so these bars stick up from the footing and go into the column. So seven inches of these bars are grouted inside the sleeve, but eight inches are not grouted inside the footing. And of course, the reason there is to spread the plastic strain so the bars do not fracture a fixed location. Here are some pictures of the construction, and you can see some of the bars are actually bent inwards and some are bent outwards. And you can see the template. Of course, if you don't have the template, that's not going to work. And in the precast one, you can see the pre-grout operation where the bars are sticking out from the column and they are inserted into the grouted ducts. In the second configuration, you can see the footing again, and this is the debonding using regular duct tape. And of course, where the red line is, is roughly where the column is going to be sitting. So you can see 
that there is the bonding in the footing here. Again, we have to have a template. And here you can see the post-grout operation where the grout is pumped from the bottom hole of the sleeve and out at the top. And this is the casting place, remember, where you can see there is no <coughs> lap splices at all on the plastic hinge zone. The bars are continuous all the way to the top. So in the test setup, we have axial load, which corresponds about 6% of the capacity of the column, which is typical for multi-column bends. And then we applied the, a drift, two cycles at each drift level, starting at half the yield and so forth, and all the way to failure. The axial load is connected here with a pin connection, so it's like a follower load as we push east and west. So I'm going to show you the results, but just as a reminder, what did he say was precast one? So precast one is the one where the sleeves are in the footing. Precast two is the one where the sleeves are in the column and eight inches of the bonding. So precast one, you can see we have a, a pretty decent performance. I went up to about six and a half, let's say, drift ratio and the bars uh, <coughs> fractured. There was a bar that fractured, I'm going to show it. About two inches above the footing to column interface. And this happened at the very last cycle. Here is the second alternative, precast two. This one went further. You can see went almost to 8% drift. But again here, the bar fracture due to low cycle fatigue at about the very end here, the 8% drift. And this bar fractured half an inch inside the footing. It was the east bar in both cases. And here is the cast in place. This particular one went about 9 to 10%. In this particular one, we fractured the bars, both the east bar and the west bar, roughly from, I think the east bar was one and a half inch above the footing interface, and the west bar two inches above the footing interface. So clearly, the one that performed the best is the cast in place. This particular one, where the sleeves are in the footing, did not perform exactly as we expected, but this one, where the sleeves are in the column with debonding into the footing, performed rather well. So here are some pictures at 3% drift, where we get the spalling at 7%. This is the first alternative with the sleeves in the footing. And then towards the end of 7%, we see the bar fracture as I said, one and a half inches above the <coughs> column to footing interface. Here is the one where the sleeves are in the column, and you can see we get a little slip at about 6%, and then at 8%, we see a bar fracture into the footing. It's about half an inch below the column to footing interface. And this particular here is the cast in place. And you can see at 6%, we see the hinge. And at about 8%, one of the bar fractures and 9% <coughs> the other bar fractures. So here is the energy dissipation. And we can see that the second precast member approaches rather well the cast in place. And here is the damping ratio. So the interesting thing is we, if we plot the curvature curves with respect to height, we see that the precast one has developed a quite nice curvature at the base of the column. And this simulates pretty well the cast in place because when the sleeves are in the footing, the column above the footing behaves almost like it was supposed to be cast in place. However, at a lower drift, we see the low cycle fatigue happening because of stress concentration. And that's when we get the fracture in the bars. As opposed to the second specimen where the sleeves are in the column, and now we see disruption into the curvature because at that point, the bars inside the sleeve are not quite uh, yielding. They yield outside the sleeve. We get a, a little bit of a reduction inside the sleeve. And then below that, of course, it behaves as normal. So after we looked at these test results, we decided, well, are we going to design these connections uh, for precast construction and accelerated construction at that. So we thought, well, we need to uh, analyze this and look at some previous research, what have people done? 
And of course, the first objective is to replicate the experimental results both in terms of global response and localized response and sectional response. And then hopefully, if this works out and we can emulate what happened in the test, we can apply these proposed models for design of columns for actual design details. And actually, UDOT, based on our work, has moved forward and produced specification. So there has been work done in this area. Azarab has modeled his test from Reno, and as well as Haber, he also used fiber elements and to model the performance of the experiments. So we decided to also move forward. And one of the things that we've realized is in order to make the models physical, we want to use distributed plasticity and force-based beam column elements. But this is a typical picture of a force-based element with fibers, fiber elements. But one of the things that is known about fiber elements is that when you have strain softening response, like we saw in our test, these fiber elements, when you use integration points, depending on the number of points, you lose objectivity in modeling the hysteretic behavior of your member. So we've decided to take another approach, and we went back and looked at some of the reference, and there is a beam column element uh, developed by Scott and Fenris, which is called force-based beam column element with a plastic integration scheme. And it seemed to us that what we were doing here, we were trying to emulate casting plates. So maybe we could look at that, the casting plates, and try and transform our precast elements by using a different length of a plastic hinge. I mean, that's the whole idea. Can we model with changing our plastic hinge? And of course, there are many empirical relationships that relate the plastic hinge to performance. This shows a little graphic of the Scott and Fenris, and later on, Scott and one of his students uh, further modified it. But of course, everybody here knows the plastic hinge length expressions for casting plates. But what is the plastic hinge length for an ABC member like this one? We don't know. And so, in fact, that became sort of the goal of the study, to iteratively find the fictitious plastic hinge that would work with this plastic hinge integration scheme model. In addition, we saw in our test, of course, that we do have failure due to low cycle fatigue, and the pretty famous model is the coffin Munson. Uh, Brown and Kunan has a publication on this. And uh, trying to model it in open seas, you, you can use reinforcing steel material, which is pretty capable of predicting the low cycle fatigue life. And it was actually used in our model. So we saw in the test that this was, and also we did some that I did not mention on column to cap beam connections, there is significant bond slip. So how do we model the bond slip? Because that influences both the local and the global response. In one of the <coughs> previous works, I think Haper did try to model the bond slip using a pseudo stress strain relationship for column bars. And we tried to do the same thing, but we looked a little bit differently at what happens at the end. So we can look at the pseudo stress strain by just looking at the end displacement at the bottom of our sleeves and dividing that by the plastic hinge. And of course, again, I have to say that I don't know what this is for the precast members, but at least we know what it is for the casting place members. So what happens is your stress strain behavior of a perfectly bonded bar now starts to shift because this is a pseudo reinforcing bar and you can see it in dotted lines if you include the effect of bond slip. And of course, as I said, I am very thankful to the first two speakers, and now you will know why, not just for their presentation, but also for their previous work. So there is work on Morita and the Watanen Tipa from Berkeley, where they did bond slip one-dimensional models developed for reinforcing bars in concrete using zero length elements. And in open seas, you can use multilinear material with little springs to represent this. And of course, what do you do if you have sleeves, unbonded sleeves, like the ones with the grout that I'm using? Well, I didn't do this test, but thankfully, uh, Stuck and 
his professor, Stanton, did them. And they only did the test, they actually developed the model with one dimensional, again, nonlinear trace elements. And they have a very nice MATLAB that tells you how to do it at the end of the report. And we studied that very carefully. So we took that and we actually tried to apply it in our grout at Splice Sleep. And it does work. There is not much difference between this and the grouted duct. Okay, this is a grouted sleeve, but what's the difference between a grouted duct and a grouted sleeve? In fact, inside the sleeve, we have corrugations exactly like it is in a grouted duct. So if you're wondering how many little springs there are here, there are 50 on each side away from the middle of this separator for the two bars. So, as we said earlier, these are the two things we're going to use. We're going to use confined and unconfined constitutive laws. And, and the reason we're using unconfined, I forgot to mention, is that little cone that forms at the end of the sleeve. It's unconfined region. There is actually a little cone forming also at the top. But the bigger one is at the bottom because the diameter is about two and a half inches. So there is more uh, opportunity for that cone to form. So we're taking care of that, and so we're modeling both confined, which is most of the sleeve, and unconfined constitutive laws from Stuck for the gravid splice sleeves. So the unconfined is the black dotted, and the confined is the black solid. And this is for the sleeve. And for the regular bars, we're using Elliphausen for both unconfined and confined, and that's the red line. In order to validate all this, we need somewhat of a stress strain behavior for one dimension. And Haber at Reno actually did this test, 2013, and he developed a stress strain curve from his experiment, which is the black light. And here's what we get with the proposed model. So it's a pretty good match, we think, both in stress and in, in strain. So moving forward, with this one force base beam column element, with the plastic hinge integration scheme, we try to estimate what is the plastic hinge length for casting place using different expressions from the literature. And the goal here is to transform the precast column to an equivalent <coughs> casting place column, but with a fictitious plastic hinge length. And that's our goal. So we use one element with two nodes. There's a node here and a node here. And the only thing you need to put in, other than all these things that I've been talking about for some time now, is the length of the plastic hinge. And that's an easy deal to do with casting place because Hersley predicts about half a diameter of the column, which is almost a circular, not quite circular, but we make it look circular. There is 40 <coughs> subdivisions here, radially and 20 circularly. And the key is, of course, we have a region outside the sleeve, which is section BB, and then of course we have a region inside the sleeve, or this fictitious plastic hinge, we might call it. And of course we have unconfined and confined sections in there. We have the core, and then we have fictitious bars. But the key is, how do you know this is 8 inches, or how do you know it's 10 inches? I don't. No one knows that. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to do the uh, global response and match the hysteretic energy, and then we're trying to do the local response and match the moment curvature. If we can do that, then we, have, we can say we have done it. We have found what this equivalent plastic hinge length needs to be, and our model can work and predict our tests. So we have an axial load here and a cyclic load over here. So this represents the portion of the column above the interface. Concrete four material for confined and unconfined concrete in open seas. Reinforcing steel material for outside the plastic hinge zone and inside the plastic hinge zone, reinforcing steel with pseudo stress strength properties, as you can see over here. So, in fact, you do have to produce a flow chart, and the flow chart will tell you you estimate the length of the plastic hinge in one of these three cases. You construct the pseudo stress strain relationship inside the plastic hinge with the proper properties, and you run it. Is the global response acceptable? You compare the hysteresis curves, but not only that, you also compare the hysteretic energy, and if it's accept acceptable, you move forward. If not, you have to come back and redo this, 
and you have to do this 10 to 20 times. It's not going to work the first time. Once that works, then you go to the local response, which is the moment curvature. And if the moment curvature doesn't work, which will be five to 10 times, you go back and you get another estimate of the plastic engine. All right, and then if you work with the moment curvature, then you can look and see whether low cycle fatigue predicts the end of your hysteresis. And that takes about five or 10 more iterations. And if you can't predict it, then you can stop. You have graduated. This is not my work. This is, of course, my PhD student. So here is the results. These are shown up to the last cycle, one before the local fracture of the bars. We predicted that, by the way, but I'm not showing it for visibility. But you can see that the cast in place ended requiring 12 inches, which is roughly half the diameter of the column. Precast one with the sleeves in the footing, eight inches. Precast two with the sleeves in the column and debonding, 10 inches. This is the hysteretic energy comparison, the deviation between five to 11%. And this is the moment curvature at 6% drift. That's when LVDTs reach their stroke limit. And again, this is between five to 11%. Since I saw the two minute warning, I'm concluding. The casting plates had excellent performance, of course, ductile, column bars fracture during eight and nine percent drift ratio due to low cycle fatigue. Precast one if the sleeves in the footing failed during the seven percent, and precast two failed at the eight percent drift ratio. It looks like the bonding of the bars, as was mentioned earlier, results in longer performance life. A two-dimensional model was developed in the analysis to transform a precast column to an equivalent casting place column with a plastic hinge. Close agreement both for global and local response. Bone slip was included with a pseudo stress strain relationship using a one dimensional bone slip model in the plastic hinge zone. Low cycle fatigue was also implemented as termination criteria as observed in the experiments. Plastic hinge of the casting place is in good agreement with empirical relationship and plastic hinge for precast one and precast two was found to be 67 and 83 percent of that obtained for the casting place. These are all the references you have to read to do this. And I want to acknowledge Utah, New York, Texas DOT, Mountain Place Consortium, Graduate School, University of Utah, NMB Splice in North America. So thank you.